The problem is you, you do see a lot of antisocial people succeed. Loneliness is as big a risk factor for ill health and death. Uh, you know, we live inside our heads. You go cold turkey, you go into withdrawal. There is a lot of value in the stuff that we struggle with. Better Thinking, conversations with experts exploring all things psychology. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name is Nesh Nikolic, and my guest today is Dr. Mark Horowitz, here to talk about tapering off SSRIs to mitigate withdrawal symptoms. Dr. Horowitz is a trainee psychiatrist and clinical research fellow at Northeast London NHS Trust, where he runs a psychiatric drug deprescribing clinic. He is an honorary research fellow at University College London, and he co-authored the Royal College of Psychiatrists Guide on Stopping Antidepressants. He has authored multiple academic papers on how to safely stop psychiatric drugs in high-impact journals and lectured on this topic around the world to doctors, pharmacists, and the public. He was commissioned by Health Education England to prepare a module on safe deprescribing of antidepressants for prescribers in the National Health Service, and he has lived experience in stopping psychiatric drugs, which has informed his work too. It's been a great pleasure to talk to Dr. Horowitz, who is incredibly well-informed in this topic and I think communicates this uh, uh, this message incredibly well. This was maybe one of my favorite conversations that I've had to date on this podcast, and I hope you enjoy it because of the ramifications of understanding this information for many Australians and, and others are around the world are absolutely mind-blowing. I think we should give our community a really good chance to both decide to come on medication and to come off medication. In particular, today's topic is about how to do so safely with SSRIs. Enjoy. Mark, a big thank you for coming on to the program today. I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time, so I'm looking uh, at this as an opportunity to learn and and also get a better appreciation of antidepressants, obviously SSRIs, uh, and uh, uh, I suppose the research around tapering off and, and where that's all come from, because we've certainly heard a lot of lot of information it's widely distributed about the use of antidepressants but being a clinician who works with uh, lots of clients uh, they are offering often asking lots of questions about their medications and certainly not my realm to to be discussing that with them as a psychologist but referring them through their gp psychiatrist is is important and, and maybe some some uh uh, uh, materials that could be provided. So looking forward to our conversation today. And it'd be very nice to be here, Nesh. Can I just dispute that straight away? Um, I don't want to be disagreeable. No, please. But you, absolutely, you absolutely should not be avoiding talking about these issues because you're a psychologist. So um, I think that is a grave error to make. We've done. There's been a lot of work done in England precisely on this issue on, of encouraging counsellors psychotherapists, psychologists to discuss medication with their patients. They see their patients much more often than doctors see them. They know them often much better, seeing them weekly. Medications affect the way people think and feel. It affects the way that they, uh, it, it affects their therapy. It affects their ability to live their lives. Everybody is in a position to provide medical information. You may not be in a position to provide medical advice, which is put this dose in your mouth. But everybody around us is constantly giving us medical information. YouTube videos do it. Newspapers do it. A psychologist is in a very good position to let their patients know what is known about the benefits, the harms, issues with withdrawal, and where to find useful information. Um, Doctors are are, are one source, but doctors are generally very poorly informed about the issues of coming off these drugs. They're not very well informed about the benefits and harms. So I I would not be uh, taking a step back like you've just indicated you are. There's a great guidance written by all of the counselling and psychology um, institutions in England called uh, something like um, discussing medication with patients for counsellors that I can, maybe you can put a link in the uh, 
in the description because, and it's written, written by the British Psychological Society, counselling, and all of it is with this message that psychologists are in a very good position to provide medical information about these medications and shouldn't shy away from doing so. Let's just put that out. Mark, that's a real good point in terms of medical information versus medical advice. And and uh, I think that, that, uh, that alone um, gives me much more greater confidence to be able to have those conversation of saying, Here's what the evidence is is showing, and there's different different avenues, and here's areas you can go out and find them, and and this is the information that's available to all of us, whether it's online, whether it's through you know papers like yours, uh, or at our other means as well. But uh, uh, that is, I think, um, very prudent. So thank you. Tell me a little bit about uh, your your work uh, in general. I know that I stumbled a, upon your. Uh, uh, work through a, I believe it was another podcast, and then I, as, as you do, uh, look onto the, the 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 different resources that they've spoken about or papers like yours. Tell me a little bit about your work uh, so our audience can can understand um, and how you got into it as well. Okay, so maybe I'll just contextualise that. So, um, as you can hear from my accent, I'm originally an Aussie, although I've decamped to uh, the centre of the empire in London. Uh, I grew up in Sydney and I, I went to medical school there at UNSW and I started my psychiatry training at Prince of Wales in southeast Sydney. I moved to London to do a PhD in the biology of depression and how antidepressants work. Um, and I did that in the cliche of uh, trying to work out how to fix my problems with those in my family. If you've ever watched a Woody Allen film, you'll know the kind of neurotic uh, Jewish family that I come from. Uh, and I, I went and I thought that I could solve those issues by looking at proteins and genes in a cell culture dish, uh, being a being a young and uh, misled young man. Um, at the end of my uh, at the end of my PhD, I read an article about withdrawal effects from antidepressants, and I found that to be a startling read because I had not been told about that before in my medical training or in my psychiatry training. And two thoughts came to my mind. Number one is withdrawal effects indicate tolerance you become you 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 experience withdrawal effects from a drug that you become tolerant to the more tolerant you are to caffeine the more you you receive you, you get withdrawal effects when you stop it and i thought at that point i had been on an antidepressant for 15 years and i thought what what would it be doing after 15 years number one number two drugs that cause withdrawal effects are generally not that good for you so drugs like valium a benzodiazepine or oxycontin which famously caused the opioid crisis in america are generally not good for the brain and body in the long term so I thought, what is this drug? Uh, what, what what are its effects? I had at that point had a lot of health problems whilst being on the drug, including having a lot of issues with daytime tiredness, problems with memory and concentration, which I had once had very good uh, memory and it had gone away over over years of using this drug. I was never sure if it was related to the drug, but but I had I had a, a concern about it. Um, and so reading this article prompted me to try to come off this medication, which I've been on at that point for I think 13, 14, 15 years. Uh, I'd been prescribed it when I was 21 in Sydney by a GP. I'd gone in miserable about my course and I'd received uh, Lexapro, a very common antidepressant, which I'd taken for years. And I took it like taking a vitamin. Um, so when I thought about coming off the drug, I did two things. I am a... a uh, diligent geek, and I went and read all of the articles that have been published about how to come off these drugs, uh, often written by people that I was working with, because at that point I was working at the Institute of Psychiatry, which while I was there passed Harvard as the most cited research institute for psychiatry in the world. And all of these professors wrote that discontinuation symptoms, a euphemism for withdrawal symptoms, are brief and mild, and you can stop these drugs in a few weeks without major trouble, which sounded very reassuring. I also checked the internet because uh, I'm a millennial, albeit a geriatric millennial, and I, 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 um, I got a very different story there. People said it was incredibly hard to come off these drugs. It often took them months or years. For some people, it, be it was so hard they became trapped on the drugs. They had a variety of, of, of horrific withdrawal symptoms. Um, and at that point, I was very confused. I'm a very institutionalized person. I've got six academic degrees. I am used to spending my time sitting in lecture halls, listening to professors. And so what I decided to do was to split the difference and uh, sort of go halfway. 
And so I ended up coming off my drugs over four months, my drug, uh, not much, much slower than the four weeks that guidelines recommended. I used, I used molecular biology level equipment in my laboratory uh, to make small reductions. I used a liquid version of the drug. I did that over four months. And when I got down to very low doses, my life completely exploded. I, uh, I started having trouble sleeping. I started having, um, I started to wake up in the morning in full blown panic. Like I was being chased by a wild animal. My heart was beating. I was covered in sweat. I would spend the next 10 or 11 hours a day in a state of utter panic. I took up running and I ran so many hours a week because it gave me a bit of relief that my feet bled. I was dizzy. Things around me appeared unreal. Uh, it went on day after day, then week after week. After a while, I thought, I cannot keep living like this. I ended up going back on the medication. And I think I should say the issues that put me on the drug when I was 21, I was unsure about my career. I had all sorts of existential dilemmas. I would have put out a three or four out of 10. I was a miserable young man. When I came off the drug, the symptoms I had were 10 out of 10. It was a completely different ballpark. I'd never had any of those sort of symptoms before. When I went back on the drug, I realized that I'm now on this drug, not because it's helpful to me, but because I'm unable to stop it. I realized that I, 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 was, I was trapped on this drug because of withdrawal effects. Um, I went back on the drug. I returned to Sydney, actually, because I was so shattered by this by this experience. And I returned to psychiatry training for a couple of years. I decided then to try again to come off my antidepressant about five years ago. And this time I understood who the experts were. They were not the professors that I'd been studying under. They were people on these online groups that had reflected exactly what I'd been through, that had worked out ways through trial and error to come off these drugs more safely. Um, and so I followed their advice. And their advice basically was to come off over months or years in very small amounts. For example, coming down by five to 10% of your most recent dose every month or so, meaning that the dose got smaller and so the, the reductions got smaller and smaller as the total dose got lower so that you were going down by very small amounts right at the end. So you could start off by going, say at 20 milligrams, going down by two milligrams a month. But when you were down to five milligrams, going down just at 0.5 milligrams a month. And two things happened when I followed their advice. Number one, I didn't have the severe withdrawal effects I had at, at the beginning. It was much easier to come off. And two, as I started coming down, those health problems that I'd mentioned started to resolve. Things with fatigue, with memory, with concentration started to get better, which really confirmed for me that it was the drugs that were causing it. The second thing was I thought, this is utterly ridiculous. How, how, how is it that I've done a PhD at the top institution in the world? You know, I could, I could count myself amongst the top 100 most informed people in the world about these drugs. And I'm learning how to come off the drugs from a retired software engineer on a peer support side. How can this possibly be happening? And so what I set about doing is writing an academic article to explain what I had learned on these websites, combined with some of the research that I'd come across in my PhD, which explained why such small doses of medication can have such large effects on the brain. Um, and I, I wrote an article that was published in the Lancet Psychiatry, a very good journal in Europe. Um, and that, that, that article led to a lot of different things that was reported in the New York Times, in the Guardian, different, different media around the world. And over the next few years, it triggered guideline change in England. So now the, the government department that, that that tells doctors what to do the nice the nice uh, puts out the nice guidelines recommends what I had put in that paper as the as the guidance for doctors coming off much more slowly, going down by very small amounts at the end, using liquids, going at a rate that people can tolerate, and being very careful for those last few milligrams. The Royal College of Psychiatrists, the equivalent of RANZIP in Australia, uh, put out similar guidance which they got me to write. The government has put a, a, a priority for the NHS, the National Health Service, to reduce inappropriate antidepressant prescribing. It has asked for clinics to be set up to help people to safely stop these drugs. I run the first such clinic in England, in, in the public health service. Um, there has been politicians, scientists, doctors, patients calling for a, a redress of the way we're prescribing, asking for prescriptions for antidepressants to go down and helping people to, to manage the issues that come uh, from coming off them too quickly. Uh, 
that has not been the case in Australia. Uh, to me, in Australia, the approach has really been uh, uh, hands over ears, hands over eyes, um, very much a denial of the problem. The guidelines in Australia have basically not changed for more than 10 years. They still recommend what was recommended years ago in England before the guidelines were updated. It's easy to come off these drugs. Most people don't have any problems, come off in a few weeks. You don't need to use liquids, no big issue. Every time the the, the issue is raised in the media, the, the, the big honchos in psychiatry in Australia say there's no issue here. If it is an issue, it's very minor. Uh, you know, this is this is unnecessary hubbub. To me, it's the it's it's a it's a similar to what happened in England, although it's ten years old. Uh, Australia has got a bit of a lag, I think. Uh, where at first people denied this issue until it became overwhelming the evidence for it, then they minimised the issue, and I think that's where we are in Australia. These these people are still saying things like, "We need more research. Let's not jump the gun." Whilst we have three million people on antidepressants in Australia one in seven adults. We know that half of them will have trouble coming off their drugs, their antidepressants. Possibly up to a quarter of them will have severe effects coming off their drugs. And still there's been no, no recognition of this issue um, by, the, by the health system in Australia and, and mostly denial from the, the College of Psychiatry. And so it is a very different story in Australia than it is in England, uh, which is disappointing to me. Mark, it's uh, really concerning to hear this. My experience, uh, limited experience, but but nonetheless experience working with people who are uh, <laughs> having difficulties with substance dependence or, or, or abuse or more often than not both. When they go on to something like the methadone program, they have similar direct effects to reducing their medication or reducing their methadone program as you as what you've discussed with SSRIs. I know that so many clients that I've seen are very easily able to tolerate, you know, a drop uh, from, you know, 100 mils of methadone to 90 mils of methadone with, with basically saying that I don't I don't notice much difference. But once they get down to 10 mils, uh it, it's a completely different game. And 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 to go down, you know, a, a mil well, for some of them, brings back all those uh, horrific um, withdrawal effects, you know, the shakes and feeling very sick and, and, and you know, the, the awful experience, which really becomes a forcing factor of returning to a greater dose or obviously going out and, and um, finding drugs again to, to, to try and uh, uh, battle off all those, all those um, symptoms. Uh, I don't think that's very well understood or un or known about SSRIs. So it's, it's very alarming. So you're, make, you're making two brilliant points there, Nesh, that I can just pick up on. Number one is you're exactly describing the exact same thing for opioids. So I've also written about that. Can I share? Can I share a slide? I know that this is mostly going on as a podcast, but I'll just Please. I'll read. Share. So I'll have to make me co-host so I can do it in a second. I'll keep talking while you do that. Um, it's the exact same pattern for opioids as it is for antidepressants, that these uh, smaller doses have bigger effects than people expect. Um, and that's why going down at the end is much harder. Um, I think if you click on the three dots at the top of my, oh, you did it. Um, uh, I'll just quickly share a slide um, because, oops, sorry, you'll have to ignore my messy desktop. Uh, just gonna show, It'll, it'll make a lot of sense to people. Um, what you're describing is linear tapering, coming down by 10 milligrams every time. And the problem comes is this. So this is the way that antidepressants affect the brain. Uh, this is dose of antidepressant on the x-axis, and this is effect on the brain. It happens to be on the serotonin system. And the, 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 the issue is it's not a straight line. It's a curve called a hyperbola. So the most common dose of citalopram given out, a very common antidepressant, is 20 milligrams or sometimes 40 milligrams. And the kicker is two milligrams. And so the smallest tablet in Australia is 20 milligrams. Two milligrams, which sounds like a tiny little dose, actually has half the effect of 60 milligrams. And because people don't understand that, they make the mistake of doing what you've just said. When they recommend to patients how to come off the drug, they say, well, let's go down by, say, five milligrams every couple of weeks. 
And the first reduction from 20 milligrams to 15 causes a very small change in effect on the brain. 15 to 10, a bit bigger. 10 to 5, bigger again. And 5 to 0 is like jumping off a cliff. If you think about walking down this, it's like walking down a garden path that becomes steeper and steeper and turns into a cliff. And people fall off this cliff. And doctors think, well, if they can't come off these last few milligrams, they must need it. It must, it must be some sort of psychological need. But actually, it's a physiological problem because these drugs have such large effects at small doses. This is the, the, the identical graph exists for methadone. So the last 10 milligrams can be 20 times harder to come off than the first 10 milligrams. And that's why we've developed a technique called hyperbolic tapering, which basically takes this into, into account. That's what my research is about. If you reduce the drug by even amounts of effect on the brain rather than even amounts of dose, what you need is smaller and smaller size reductions that go down to very small doses. And that's the that's the approach that we that's now adopted in England. And that's called hyperbolic tapering because this curve is, is, is a hyperbola and it involves going down to doses that are much smaller and commonly used doses. And that's why things like liquid versions of the drug are important. Um, and the second point, sorry, from what you said, is the issue of withdrawal effects and dependence versus addiction. So one thing that confuses people about this topic is mixing up addiction and physical dependence. So physical dependence is a physiological process that occurs to anybody taking drugs over time. Uh, so taking antidepressants or benzodiazepines or opioids, your brain will adapt to the drug because the brain, that's what the brain does. When it's too hot outside, we cool ourselves down by sweating. When it's too cold outside, we warm ourselves up by shivering. When a drug produces an increase in neurotransmitters, our brain will become less sensitive to those neurotransmitters. And that's what causes tolerance to the drug, like for caffeine. And that process is normally called physical dependence. And when you stop the drug, you'll get withdrawal effects. Physical dependence has nothing to do with abuse, misuse, craving, compulsion, stealing. You know, that is all to do with addiction. So people with addiction issues have physical dependence and they also have um, compulsion, craving. It can lead to misuse and abuse. So when you talk about people on methadone not being able to stop because of withdrawal symptoms. That's very much about physical dependence on methadone. And the same thing exactly applies for antidepressants. It's not because people are addicted. It's because the withdrawal effects are so unpleasant that people can't tolerate it. What's uh, frightening talking about this topic is the volume of clients that I have seen who have tried to reduce their medication or come off their medication and they become convinced that there is a problem because their experience in coming off is extremely difficult. And so that that provides them at least psychological evidence to say to them, I need this. You see, it is working because what I'm feeling uh, is proof. Uh, and um, I, 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 I can't... Um, fathom right now the the volume of clientele that not only i've seen i imagine it, it this is a standard experience across the board whether it's australia or, or across the world uh, the misunderstanding of of being that this must be related to my my, my well-being uh, rather than a dependence and and um uh, people not given the opportunity of testing that by going to have a hyperbolic tapering system uh, is a major problem because then we're effectively doing n equals one and it didn't work so therefore that's that's proof that i should be taking this for the rest of my life again you put your finger exactly on the on the major issue this is this is a repeated phenomenon it, it, it tricks both patients and doctors and you're exactly right people constantly mistake withdrawal effects from coming off these drugs for evidence that they need the drugs so I'll just unpack that a little bit. Um, now, withdrawal effects from these drugs can be multiple. Uh, you know, your, 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 your brain and body gets used to the drugs. When you reduce them or stop them, your brain misses the drugs, and that leads to withdrawal effects. The two major categories of withdrawal effects are psychological symptoms and physical symptoms. Psychological doesn't mean it's in people's heads. It means that the withdrawal effects affect the brain, and that's what causes psychological withdrawal symptoms. 
everyone will be aware of that from coming off recreational drugs. People coming off ecstasy or alcohol will have psychological withdrawal effects. And that's true for antidepressants. And the psychological withdrawal effects from antidepressants can include low mood, anxiety, panic attacks, um, crying spells, people can become suicidal. I had some of those symptoms. Um, and they are the symptoms that confuse people the most because they can be reminiscent of the issues for which people went on the drugs. Um, the other set of symptoms are physical symptoms, things like headache, dizziness, electric zaps in people's heads, this sort of strange sensation of a little bolt of electricity experienced in people's heads. People get muscle cramps. They can be dizzy. They can appear, they can have things appear to be unreal around them. But it's the psychological symptoms that are, can be the most confusing. Um, and exactly as you say, people think, well, I'm, I'm very unwell without the drugs. I must need the drugs. To, to use a crude analogy, that's the same as people thinking, if I stop smoking and I become anxious and irritable, I must need to keep smoking to prevent becoming anxious and irritable. You know, it's the same. That, that sounds absurd because we all know that cigarettes cause withdrawal symptoms when you stop them. And having withdrawal symptoms doesn't mean you need the drug. It means you need to come it more slowly. And the problem with antidepressants is um, people are making that error and people do have similar issues, which makes it harder to distinguish. So there's a few... Um, so a few things to say about this. Number one, um, most people do not have recurring severe disorders. So by the age of 45, 70% of people will meet the criteria for clinical depression or clinical anxiety. It's more of us that meet the criteria than don't. So it's a very common condition. Most people are prescribed antidepressants in the context of a stressor in their life, after divorce, after job loss, after sickness, after death in a family, so most people are prescribed a drug at a very difficult point in their lives. Uh, most people recover from that, whether they use medication or not. That's the natural history of depression and anxiety. Uh, different things can help people through it. Um, so for most people, this idea of relapse, a return of their condition, doesn't make sense. You can't have a relapse of divorce. You can't have a relapse of job loss, you know, unless you're very unlucky. Uh, and so, so the idea that things could come back is, is is already for most people. There are some people that might have severe recurring conditions, but they're the minority of people because three quarters of us have these issues in our lives. So number one, the idea of these symptoms coming back is a bit, um, I think, a, a misframe. The second issue is um, we experience withdrawal symptoms through our own minds. So, for example, if me and you both sat down and drank a, a large um, uh a jug of coffee, we'd both become very anxious, but we've become anxious in very typical ways of ourselves. You worry about the things you worry about, I worry about uh, my hair. Um, uh, and the same is true for people coming off these medications. Uh, you know, we have generic, when we feel anxious, when we feel depressed, it's through our own mind. And so these withdrawal symptoms can feel very familiar to people. They think this is, this is how I felt before. And that's what can be confusing to people. Um, what I suggest to doctors and to patients to, to try to distinguish these things are if the symptoms come on fairly soon after reducing or stopping a drug, it's very much likely to be withdrawal effects and not a return of an underlying condition. It can get tricky because sometimes withdrawal effects are delayed by several weeks. We think that's because the drug can stick around in the brain for longer than we thought. That can make it tricky. The second thing is to compare the symptoms you had before you went on the drug with the symptoms that you have now coming off the drug. So, for example, if you went on the drug because, you know, a tragedy happened in your family, your mother died, you were very depressed and lethargic, sleeping all the time, and now years later you come off the drug and you're very anxious, you can't sleep and you're having panic attacks, it's much more likely that you're experiencing withdrawal effects from the drug rather than coincidentally at that moment you've stopped the drug, you've suddenly developed a new panic disorder. Possible, but very unlikely. Uh, and so I think it's very useful to compare how you were before and afterwards the other thing people say that the, the presence of other symptoms, headache, dizziness, brain zaps also marks it out. And then the intensity, you know, when people say these are the worst symptoms I've ever had, like I did, you know, it's very unlikely that your mental health problem has gotten a lot worse for no good reason while taking the drug. It's much more likely that those are withdrawal symptoms. And the last thing that can help people distinguish is when you go back on the drug soon after stopping, generally the symptoms go away in a few days. Uh, whereas that's not 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 as likely if it's a return of your condition. So you're right, it's a really huge issue, this misdiagnosis of withdrawal as a return of people's condition and then misinterpretation that this is a sign you need the drug. Mark, I'm I'm 
thinking a little bit ahead in terms of how Australia might be able to learn from the UK and I assume there's other countries that have taken on a similar uh, understanding and use this evidence base to to change their protocols and guidelines. Um, what has been the barriers uh, that you've observed for the guidelines to be reviewed um, and and I suppose considered before being adopted? What what is it that gets in the way? You know, being a a scientist <clears throat> practitioner, and I I, I appreciate appreciate that. Uh, psychologists probably hold that uh, differently than than medicine does, but we're still holding the same philosophy and understanding and reasonings for it. But being a scientist practitioner, I would have thought that this is a a fairly clean cut understanding. If what you're saying is is valid and true, and we've got scientific evidence that, that demonstrates it, it's something that can be replicated and so on. And clearly it has if the UK has taken this on board uh, uh, from their prior uh, approach and prior guidelines. What, have, what what sort of backlash have you experienced? What, 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 what will Australia likely need to overcome? Great question, Nish. Uh, um, look, there, there are lots of barriers to this um, and it's because, uh, I mean, if anyone, if anyone's watched Dope Sick about the opioid crisis, uh, how that unfolded in America, and and how drug companies and their spokespeople sort of set up these conditions, you know, opioids are more dangerous drugs than antidepressants. There, there's not there's not a million dead people um, from from antidepressants like there is for opioids, but the structure of the marketing and the misinformation around these drugs is a very is very similar. So I'll I'll walk you through it and I'll tell you how it plays out today in Australia. Um, so look, you know, I'm, I'm a big I'm a big believer in the scientific method. I've spent my whole life doing science, but but the scientific um, uh, uh, the, the breadth of scientific knowledge is is who has paid for the studies. So when it comes to antidepressants, ninety seven percent of studies have been paid for by the manufacturers of the drugs, and that means that there's an inherent bias to to make the drugs look more positive than they are, more effective. And to minimise their harms, because that is the commercial imperatives of these of these drug companies. They're doing what they set out to achieve. They're not they're not in it for the public good. They're in it to to improve their shareholders' returns, and that means that the the literature is distorted in various ways, particularly to, towards short term studies. So ninety five percent of antidepressant studies go for six to twelve weeks, and that has that has really led to um, a huge distortion of, of of our understanding. So I'll. I'll just explain it a little bit. That's quite um, bizarre, Mark. That that they're so short yeah. because that is not the uh, the experience of how most people use them. Uh, and I do know that someone like Joanna Moncrief, uh, that I've looked at some of her work, she does specifically look at short term intervention as being, uh, at least in her um, research, as being best practice and 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 using them in those times and tapering off as quickly as you can thereafter, so that you can use it again later when when it's when it's uh, uh, important like in severe and acute s- situations but to have the majority of research showing uh, you know six to eight weeks uh, at least me that, that that raises some question marks you should you, that's 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 the right response uh, and I and I agree with what what professor Moncrief has said um it, it is I would say it's bizarre I mean I, so so you know, the average period of time that someone is using an antidepressant in Australia is four years. In America, it's getting it's creeping towards ten years. Um, the there's a famous professor of psychiatry called Professor Alan Francis in America who has described the the prescribing of antidepressants to the public for years and decades in the context of six to twelve week trials as being the biggest open air experiment ever conducted on humans. And I think that's true because we simply don't know what these drugs do in the long term because of these short term studies. We're getting some we're getting some disturbing um, ideas from people. Um, so I'll tell, you, I'll tell you how that has misled the field. Now, uh, the drug companies performed all these studies on what happens when you stop antidepressants, and they focused on people who've been on the drugs for eight weeks. And when you stop antidepressants after eight weeks, most people have mild and brief withdrawal symptoms. Uh, and that's they published a, half a dozen papers 
They printed them out. They sent them to all the major doctors in America and the UK. And that became the mantra, brief and mild withdrawal symptoms. Actually, they used a, a euphemism, discontinuation symptoms, as a way to protect their drug from criticism. And that entered the guidelines in Australia and England, because that's what every paper says. Now, we know that the longer you're on these drugs, the more severe withdrawal effects are, the longer they're going to last, um, and the more trouble people are going to have coming off them. So uh, so eight-week studies are almost irrelevant for people on the drugs for four years. To me, it's a bit like a car company saying, when we crash our cars at five kilometres an hour into a wall, there's no trouble, ignoring the fact that most people are driving at 60 kilometres an hour. And so that that is why it has been very difficult to overturn the consensus that existed a few years ago in England that these symptoms are brief and mild. It took a lot of work to bring this to light for a lot of different researchers and activists highlighting the, those studies. Um, now, that sets up a few different dynamics. Number number one, um, there, are, there are professors of psychiatry who have been paid to become spokespeople for the drug companies. So there is no direct-to-consumer advertising in Australia. You don't have ads on the TV about the drugs. So one of the major, one of the major conduits to advertising to a, a major target audience, which, which is doctors, is hiring professors of psychiatry to deliver the message. Because you don't hear from the CEO of AstraZeneca or Janssen. You hear from professors at UNSW, at Monash, at Melbourne, Sydney University, giving lectures to GPs. And those professors often get paid six or seven figures a year to, to provide these messages. And they deliver messages that these drugs are highly safe, effective, and easy to stop, because that's that's what... Um, that's what the there's, there's published research that says that that they're quoting and they're delivering that message to to, to the target audience, um, and that means that informs medical education, that informs what what students are being taught, and that informs what doctors are being taught. And so for years and years, doctors have been educated these these drugs are easy to stop, no major issues when you stop them. That sets up um, a, a, the issue where doctors cannot recognise what they haven't been taught to recognise. So when a patient walks into their office and says. I'm having panic attacks, I can't sleep, I just stopped my drug. They don't even think of withdrawal effects because the guidelines say they're brief and mild. If someone's coming in, you know, they're losing the plot, they think there must be a relapse of their condition. And so they're unable to see what they haven't been taught to see. And that means the, the issue is not recognised. Um, so the major barriers at the moment in Australia are the drug companies have actually exited the arena. So so almost all antidepressants are off patent now. So there's no money being made by drug companies. What is left are these opinion leaders. That's what they call, they're called key opinion leaders or paid opinion leaders that are protecting their good names because they've spent 25 years telling the public these drugs are whiz bang, you know, sort you out, easy to stop. And now that there's more and more evidence coming out that's not true, they are on the back foot, very defensive, uh, have a lot of power. A lot of them have very big, big bullhorns and they are denying and minimizing these issues. So they are one of the major barriers to progress. It happened that the same, the same kind of debate happened in England and they were essentially overwhelmed by, by the weight of evidence. And also the number of stories in the media of people having trouble and that eventually forced their hand to make concessions. We haven't yet got there in Australia. There seems to be uh, starting to be more and more uh, media coverage of this issue. You know, we know that with 3 million Australians on these drugs, you know, a million or two of them are going to have trouble coming off. So it's only going to be, you know, more of an issue as the years go on. <clears throat> it seemed like turning the ship around is very difficult, even from a psychological problem in that it's very difficult to put your hand up and say, maybe I got this wrong. You know, Absolutely. Even if, even if uh, you know, I'd like to think that, and I, I think I'm valid in saying this, 99.9% .9 of, of, of doctors are fantastic, brilliant, amazing people who are yep. you know, give their entire life to the service of the community, trying to support them and help them as best as humanly possible. It's still very difficult to say, maybe I've been practicing in a way that um, uh, hasn't had, that hasn't shown the full picture. Um, and, and that can be a little bit embarrassing, for example. Um, and just from a human perspective, it's hard to go back on what you've held to be true. I mean, that, that that's what core beliefs are, right? The, if we look at psychology, it, it, we spend a lot of time trying to work with our clients around, you know, our regular core beliefs of I'm not good enough, I'm 
uh, not lovable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and when someone has been openly saying to the community, this is what you uh, should expect because we know that to be the truth, uh, it's very hard to turn that back around. I, I agree. It's a very good point, Nash. <clears throat> um, uh, you know, I agree with you completely. I, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not at all doctor bashing. I agree with you. Ninety nine point nine percent are are very well meaning. You know, GPs, psychiatrists, they're in it to to do a good job. A lot of them are my friends, uh, or used to be. Uh, you know, I I uh, I um I agree with that. I, I know they they want to do a good job. I think they've been misinformed about yeah. the trouble coming up, drugs, and that's that's the source of this issue. Um, you're right about cognitive dissonance. You know, I would be very upset if someone came up to me and said. You know all this hard work you've put in actually you're you're causing people more harm than than good and what you've been doing you know has been hurting people i would be very upset to hear that and i'd probably be pretty angry at the messenger as uh many psychiatrists are at, at me i understand that um i think that you're right i think it's happened several times before though we've sort of been through this before in fact it's a recurring pattern in psychiatry a drug comes out people say whiz bang drug solve human ills safe and effective, easy to stop. The first such drug was barbiturates in the 1950s, you know, given to housewives to, 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 to calm their nerves. Of course, it turned out it was very hard to stop, withdrawal effects, not so effective. They were replaced by benzodiazepines like Valium. It's on the front cover of Time. We've solved, you know, we don't need Freud anymore. We've solved uh, mental health problems, safe and effective, easy to stop. Of course, those drugs wear off, not so effective, very hard to stop. They were They were kind of pushed away in Australia and England, replaced by antidepressants. So it looks like a recurring pattern mm. uh, happening now with gabapentinoids. pregabalin has been in the news in England all this week because it was another new drug, brilliant for anxiety, easy to stop, no major side effects. It's turned out it's highly addictive, dependence forming, very hard to stop. So there is this recurring pattern um, where we sort of think this drug is a is a is a panacea and it turns out it's got a lot of issues so uh you know i i'm hoping that doctors will learn from this and be more skeptical when the next drug comes out that's a whiz bang uh solution that with no issues to be a bit more discerning about how drug companies often shape the literature that, that they publish mm. and maybe there's something in in this in that there's hope that we can turn this around because it was turned around for example, uh, uh, with benzodiazepines, I know in Australia, uh, I hear very frequently from my clients how well the GPs are doing it, at least in my view, not necessarily in the client's Sorry, view. I agree. They're I saying, agree. I want more. These things work. They're amazing. But I do hear them saying, but the doctor won't give them to me. They'll only give me you know, 10 pills at a time or six pills at a time, and and they won't re-prescribe after you know, a week or a fortnight. Uh, and and when they do, it's on very limited understanding that you're not going to get another prescription after this. And so they're very tight on it because we know how incredibly, uh, and maybe this is the wrong word, but I, but um, uh, I'll use it anyway, how addictive they are because of the affect and I'm sure the uh, withdrawals are quite significant and so on and so forth. Uh, so, you know, Xanax is very difficult to get your hands-on in, in in Australia these days. And so maybe there's some hope there, but that doesn't necessarily mean this will happen just easily and organically. It's going to need voices uh, like yours to to talk about this. And, and, and for, I suppose, for clients, and maybe this is that first point of maybe there's a psychologist role to provide medical information uh, to start that conversation for for people to to start to question it and and look at it because I don't believe we have a liquid form of SSRIs in in Australia. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, I I don't know if that is even prescribable. I know that you know often medications give you X dose and that's it. You get 20 milligrams and that's our lowest and that's kind of it. You know you can break it in half, but uh, that's that's the limit that we get to. So I'll speak to both those points. So I agree with you on benzodiazepines. I think Australian doctors are pretty sensible when it comes to benzodiazepines. I'm glad to hear that's your impression as well. Um, that was the result um, of huge outcry about withdrawal and dependence effects from benzodiazepines. It actually led to uh, thousands of lawsuits in England, which is what made doctors wary of prescribing it. And that sort of filtered uh -huh. out in the 
Um, you know, I think it's it's I think there's something to be learned from that because you know benzodiazepines work, uh, but what does work mean? You know, work means they make you feel less anxious, that you feel better, but they wear off over time. You know, you get dependent on them. I'd say dependence for me, not addictive, but but I, I take your point. Oh, and when you. you come off when you when you come off them, you get withdrawal effects. So you know, I would say you know they work temporarily and they cause big problems in the long term. You know, and the closest analogy to that is alcohol. You know, benzodiazepines are very similar to alcohol. You know, there's they're a bit less dangerous to the liver, but there's a lot in common with them. You know, so what you're doing is you're taking someone who's anxious or depressed, and now you're adding on a dependence issue. So you're not doing anybody any 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 uh, benefit by giving them the drugs. I think it's a similar issue with antidepressants. They're not as antidepressants are definitely not addictive because they don't give people euphoria like benzodiazepines do, but they're definitely dependence forming. They're not very effective in the long term. If they have any effects, it's probably because they numb people's emotions. That's the most common finding in surveys of people on antidepressants. So I think that doctors, in their desire to do something helpful, and that's of course what drives them, are often giving people an extra problem. They have their underlying issue whatever it is in their lives. And now they've got an issue where the drug's going to cause side effects, cause numbing of their emotions, and it'll be hard to stop. So I really think that doctors need to reframe how we're responding to distress, uh, you know, and seeing it much more as a contextual issue in people's lives, the things that are going on uh, around for them. On the topic of liquids, it's a very important point. Um, you're right. Most antidepressants are not available as a liquid in Australia. The only exception to that is Lexapro, escitalopram. That presents a very important practical barrier because you sort of heard me describe coming down milligram by milligram. How can you do it with a tablet? And the answer is you can't do it. You can only do a linear taper. And that's what traps people on these drugs is their inability to get small enough doses. What people do to get around that is, so first of all, a lot of Australians give up on their doctors. The doctor says, if you can't come off by splitting the tablets in half, then you must need the drug. And some patients get so frustrated with that. They think, you know, I've had headaches, I've had dizziness. This isn't a return of my condition. This is withdrawal effects like I went through. They end up going online like I did. And they find Facebook groups or peer support groups where there's now tens of thousands of people, thousands of Australians. And they get advice on how to crush up tablets and mix them in water uh, to make smaller doses, how to open up capsules and count beads. And all of these things are perfectly acceptable to do. It sounds like it's Walter White breaking bad territory, but actually all of these things pharmacists and nurses do every day in clinical practice. It is one option. Uh, another option is there are compounding pharmacies in Australia that can make up liquids or smaller dose capsules or tablets. So you can, it costs a bit of money. You know, it might set you back 50 bucks a month, so it's not cheap, um, but there are ways to make smaller doses. And that is definitely a practical barrier for the average GP in working out how to get people off these drugs. I'm involved in running a large scientific trial in Queensland where we are getting doctors to take people off their antidepressants by uh, crushing up tablets and mixing it in water or getting them to order compounded medication to make the process easier. Um, and we hope that will, that will help solve this issue. In England, most drugs come as a liquid because they were asked for. So if, if this becomes understood, it can be quickly solved. Manufacturers can be asked to make them as liquids. It's very simple to do. So it's just it's just a matter of will. You know, it's about people raising their voice about these issues and getting change to be instituted. It sounds like if I if I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of of uh, uh, someone who's been on on the medication for some some time, and just the nature of how Australians think, and I don't think it's very different to to other countries. Um, there would be great hesitation in crushing up your own medication and putting it in water because it just feels like, you know, you've got to follow doctor's orders. Uh, I do see there being really strong merit in compounding pharmacies because it, it removes that anxiety of, am I doing the wrong thing? Is it okay? Is this being measured? Should I be doing it? So I see the compound pharmacies as being a, a, a good measure in the meantime and until we maybe see these changes in, in in australia where you can go in and and i know there's a greater cost that'll that'll be the forcing function away from it but at least it gives maybe people an option to say i can do this methodically uh understanding what dose i'm giving myself uh, in in um uh, a methodical and and clinical way uh, it's going to cost a little bit more but should i uh 
come off in 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 a longer period of time thereafter i won't be using them so there's going to be a saving over the long term if cost is a is a factor um you know minus the obviously cost of of continuing to take them and ongoing medical appointments uh, but you know we're, we're talking about healthcare and outcomes uh, uh but I do know that that money is an important factor in this because it becomes a forcing function, you know. Uh, hence, medication can't be too expensive; otherwise, people won't use them. Uh, but uh, what's the current trialing in 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 Queensland looking at trying to bring in uh, solutions, uh, uh, a liquid form, so that that can be trialed in Australia, or because it, you kind of just have to keep doing research to um, maintain momentum. So, so I'll just I'll just say so the crushing up tablets. I know it sounds like I'm being naughty, but we we've just written a, a textbook on this. Uh, it's it's the Morsley Deprescribing Guidelines, mm -hmm. and it's got uh, it's got instructions on how to reduce antidepressants, benzodiazepines, sleeping tablets, and gabapentinoids step by step for every drug in Australia, including all the different formulations of the drug. Uh, what what which ones come as tablets? What doses? How to make them up? And and I'll just let you know the NHS provides guidance uh, in England on how to crush up tablets and, and turn it into liquids for mothers to give um, doses of medication to their children, because all tablets dissolve in all tablets will disperse in water. There's guidance all through the NHS for pharmacists on how to do this. So I know it sounds uh, beyond the pale, but it's not. Uh, in the same way as a paracetamol tablet. You know, you get those dissolvable, dispersible ones that go disperse in a glass of water. The same thing happens for antidepressants. As long as you stir them up, they're evenly distributed. So it is something, it is one option in the book so that Mark, we outline. We, we, we don't have to pay $30 for a bottle of uh, uh, Panadol for our kids. We can go back to the norm and, and do <laughs> I'm just being facetious here, but yeah, exactly, uh, exactly, but that's, exactly. That's the experience, and I know I've done that myself with, with, with my kids, looking at what what is the conversion rate so that we can give you know my yes, uh, yes. yeah all parents. I'm I'm sure have done that when you've run out of the liquid, um, but uh, so it's the Maudsley de de prescribing it's guidelines. The, it's the Maudsley de prescribing guidelines. So the Maudsley is a famous psychiatric hospital in London, and it's put out a very famous set of prescribing guidelines for many years. And we've basically written, written a spin-off, which is the de-prescribing guidelines, how to safely stop these drugs. And what we hope to do is to put this into doctors, pharmacists' hands so that they know how to get people off these drugs safely. You know, it goes through every single drug in Australia on how to do it. So it's step by step. And the reason why we wrote this is because there's dozens of books and guidelines on how to start these drugs. There's very few on how to stop them. And we wanted to fill that gap and give give doctors as much detailed information as possible so they can sit down. It's sort of ready for the clinic to to implement in practice, so that all this sort of decision making is a bit outlined for them. Um, and we we hope that that will be taken up by by clinicians in Australia as well. And Mark, can I can I say how important a resource like that is because that hesitation, that psychological hesitation of I need it to come out of a book. You know, it, it it's not valid unless it's in a in a book. And I understand that's actually probably how it should be because that means it's been researched. It's not a, you know, a uh, rabbit hole internet, you know, midnight experience. It's yeah. someone like yourself who is uh, in incredibly well researched and has gone through all the protocols. It's been reviewed, you know, other people have looked at it and, and, and it's demonstrated efficacy. Uh, and really what you're saying is, Let's just take it really slow and easy at the end. We're not we're not doing anything that is that is a uh, wild. You know, we're, we're we're saying give your body the best chance to come off these drugs, so to minimise the possibility of uh, withdrawal. Um, you know, this isn't brain surgery, so to speak. Uh, I'm not diminishing your work. I I um uh, I can't thank you enough for for your contributions. Um, certainly not diminishing it, but but you're not asking for there to be significant change. You're just saying, let's just do the reduction that is already a guideline, but in smaller doses so that people get an opportunity, uh, a, a much greater opportunity to not have any effects. Exactly. So sometimes I get a bit upset. I think I've spent three years writing a 600-page book that could be summarised <laughs> exactly, exactly with your sentence. Just go slower, especially at the end. You know that's that's true. Uh, 
you know, and 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 I, you know, I'm trying. If you remember that graph, I'm trying to get people to stop falling off that yes. cliff, come down gradually. If they can, they can walk to the bottom of that of that cliff, and many people can come off the drug. So, in the clinic that I run in London, which helps people to stop antidepressants, it is very gratifying to see people come in who have tried two, three, eight times to come off their drugs, couldn't do it. We show them these graphs. We give them a liquid version of the drug. They do it in small amounts. It often takes them six months, twelve months. 18 months, and they get off the drug, which they've been trying to get off for years. So it's a very gratifying uh, process. They often, uh, ironically enough, they often feel much better afterwards because mm. I think these drugs in the long term can have some uh, quite undesirable effects on people's mood and anxiety. So I think it's it's been uh, it's been very interesting to see. Mark, I wish we could continue this conversation for several more hours. Uh, before I let you go, uh, uh, other than the Maudsley de Deprescribing Guidelines uh, uh, book and understand this hyperbolic tapering, it, it, the importance around that, where else can our listeners go to to find out more information and and start to inform themselves? So I've got I've got a fairly dinky website at markhorowitz.org. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Mark Horow. Uh, those are probably the main places to check out my work. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Mark, I can't I can't thank you uh, uh, enough. I know that I was looking forward to this conversation immensely and and I think for for very good reasons because I have learnt uh, uh, a, a lot today and it's been a great pleasure and I I thank you for if I can just say it as I thank you for your service. Uh, I know that this sometimes comes with great costs to to be uh you know pushing the 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 trend in another direction but using the scientific method and you know, what people have been talking about and trying to give that a voice. Clearly, you've been successful in the UK of, of you know, your peers saying this actually has merit and let's change it and let's give people a, an opportunity. I hope that Australia can can also review it and, and, and have a good look and, and say maybe there's merit here because we're, we're not uh, denying people anything we're just saying maybe we can reduce this in a different way to give them a better outcome so thank you mark i really appreciate your your, your time and your experience and and uh this opportunity to talk to you thanks thanks for having me on nesh thanks for a great interview very interesting talking to you